Okay. Thank you very much for your presence here today. Uh, I think this is an important event. Uh, as, as you know, uh, we uh, are organizing this afternoon, this uh, webinar as part uh, uh, of the preparations for the second uh, United Nations Ocean Conference that will take place and be hosted by Portugal and Kenya that will take place in Lisbon from the 27th of June to the 1st of July. And that will be the most important event dedicated to the oceans uh, this year. Uh, why is this conference so important? Uh, because it is a way for the world to work together to protect our common oceans and achieve one of the most important 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG 14, while at the same time recognizing the central role our oceans can play in achieving all the SDG goals of the, agenda, of the 2030 Agenda. As noted in the conference theme, scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of Goal 14, stock taking, partnerships and solutions, it is action that is the goal of this conference and centering the debates in eight interactive dialogues will help to achieve that. Today, we will focus our discussions on one of these eight, eight main themes of the UN conference managing, protecting, conserving and restoring marine and coastal ecosystems. The importance of this theme is obviously shared by Portugal, Finland and all the Baltic Sea nations, owners of an extraordinary maritime patrimony. Our nations have a critical role to play in this conference and in the future of our oceans. We all share common values on this matter but without working together we will not be able to protect them and achieve our goals. As a political outcome, the UN Ocean Conference shall adopt an action-oriented declaration focusing on science-based and innovative areas to support the implementation of SDG 14. This declaration is being negotiated in New York under the leadership of Denmark and Grenada and we commit to working hard for a good outcome. For Portugal, it will be essential that some first level priorities be reflected in this document, including the important nexus of climate change and ocean life, solutions, decisions based on research and science, the blue economy, the complete water cycle combating pollution from plastic waste and marine litter, the conclusion of negotiations of the international legal framework for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, and initiatives related to the establishment and good management of marine protected areas. The conference will also ensure the strong engagement of all major stakeholders, namely the scientific community, academia, the private sector, non-governmental organizations and youth in an inclusive and outreaching process, something essential for the real success of this conference. That is why besides organizing these blue talks in several capitals like the one that we are uh, organizing today, uh, that we hope will help to build bridges to the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, we are also planning different side events on the margins of the conference in Lisbon and in Portugal. A sustainable blue investment and innovation forum to create a stronger connection between the private sector and the blue economy. A youth forum to promote the involvement and knowledge sharing about the ocean among younger generations. A high level symposium on water to address the full water cycle and to explore synergies between SDG 14 and 6, drinking water and sanitation. And a local and regional governments event to bring local communities into discussions so that they may be part of a common solution. In conclusion, the UN Ocean Conference's success depends on our common capacity to inspire and to mobilize. Harnessing the political will, innovative ideas, scientific knowledge and the necessary resources to bring about a fundamental change in the way we do things to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of our ocean for present and future generations. With our discussions, we hope we can help to mobilize more people to this important objective 
as we have no doubt that all Finnish and Baltic stakeholders are willing to contribute. I also hope that all these countries, especially Finland and Estonia that recover from Helsinki, will be participating in the Ocean Conference at the highest level, but also at all levels and in all the side events, raising awareness and contributing to take important and essential decisions for the future of our oceans and for our common future. Let me finish by thanking the presence of all our speakers today. Mr. Yussi Suromaki, Senior Ministerial Advisor, Marine and Maritime Policy at the Finnish Prime Minister's Office. Mr. Rudiger Strempel, Executive Secretary of HELCOM, the Baltic Marine Environment Protection Commission. And Professor Dr. Ana Colasso, a Portuguese ocean researcher at University of Açores. And also to all of our viewers. I hope that you also enjoy uh, the discussions today. Thank you all. And now I wish you all a useful and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now I invite you all to watch a video message from the UNSCG Special Envoy for, Envoy for the Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all courtesies observed and many thanks for the opportunity of addressing you today. It's not long now before many of us will meet in person at the UN Ocean Conference between 27 June and the 1st of July in Lisbon, and I look forward to that. As I'm sure you know, the UN Ocean Conferences are held in support of SDG 14, the UN's Sustainable Development Goal to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. It is my firm belief that SDG 14 and the Sustainable Blue Economy are crucial for humanity's future on this planet. The ocean's health is vital to us all, vital in the truest sense of the word, necessary for life. Just consider the fact that over 50% of the planet's oxygen is produced in the ocean, and that statement has all the veracity it needs. That is why my daily mantra is, no healthy planet without a healthy ocean, and the ocean's health is measurably in decline. Measurement of the decline is observable in rates of habitat destruction, overfishing, subsidizing of industrial fleets, through the polluting source-to-sea flow of chemicals and plastics and through accelerating rates of the ocean's acidification, deoxygenation and warming, leading to worldwide death of coral, changing ocean currents, transformation of marine ecosystems, and inexorably rising sea levels. So Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we can stop the decline of the ocean's health. We can do so in 2022. And we made a great start in Nairobi in February with UNEA's agreement to begin work on a binding global treaty to end plastic pollution. We must continue this positive momentum by ending harmful fisheries subsidies through the WTO in Geneva, by agreeing in New York upon a robust and operable BBNJ treaty for the governance of the high seas, by adopting the 30 by 30 target, the biodiversity COP in Kunming, and by moving the climate finance needle decisively in the direction of the sustainable blue economy at UNFCCC's COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in November. 2022's highlight opportunity for SDG 14 progress will be the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. There we will launch a great fleet of science-based solutions heavily powered by innovation and partnerships. And I urge you all to bring the best of your ideas, solutions and resources to the conference in Lisbon next month. The hard work is at hand. We must stop the decline in the ocean's health, and as I've described in my words today, we can do so as early as this year. That is not a throwaway line. It is very doable. Thus, it is vital, again, that word vital in its truest sense, that the international community does not squander this year's unparalleled confluence of opportunities for ocean action. And I thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm sorry, but it appears that the video uh, it has is not uh, displaying any sound, so I suggest that we continue with the presentations. Okay, Tiago. So let's continue with the presentations, starting with a presentation from Finland. 
by Mr. Yusi Soramaki, Senior Ministerial Advisor on Marine and Maritime Policy at the Prime Minister's Office. Uh, Mr. Soramaki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador for organizing this uh, Bridges to Lisbon Blue Talks here in 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 uh, with us and 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 the webinar. And I think that you raised a very important subject here, especially the climate change and marine biodiversity nexus, which must be solved in the in the near future. And I think I think that is that is a very important thing. We are we will be coming to Lisbon with a with a great delegation. Uh, at the ministerial level, uh, and and we will we are trying to organize a, a, a side event with our friends from Sweden. But as you know, we it, it's 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 crowded in Lisbon at at this time of the year, and and we we don't know yet if it's possible or not. But we are we are still trying to do that. There's something I want to say, uh, Lisbon, and, and this is not a courtesy call. Lisbon has always been a, one of my favorite cities, and I have been there a lot of times, both business, but, but also once and a twice pleasure. So I'm be, I'll be happy to spend the whole week in Lisbon. OK, could you please show me the slides or would you like me to sh show them? Uh, as you prefer, <laughs> uh, I have them here ready. Please. OK. From global to local, right? Excellent. And in my my talk, I would try to try to uh, present a picture from the global decision making to what we have done locally in Finland in uh, protecting, managing and restoring marine and coastal ecosystems. Well, I come from the prime minister's office and I have a few colleagues uh, from here from the Ministry of Environment and and I would if 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 needed um, they can they can uh, uh, let me say go more into detail on on this uh, subject can I have the next slide please we, we all know that there's a lot of going on as already referred to the the second UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon will be one of the strategic meetings that will pave the way into the future. But of course, there are other processes going on. I think the, the UNCLOS is uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction process, which I hope will be finalized soon. CBD, different CBD processes concerning oceans and seas. But also, I think that the, the resolution of the UN Environment Assembly uh, to 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 work on plastic pollution treaty is one of the more important things. The EU, of course, is the, emphasizing the role of the oceans and seas. I use the phrase oceans and seas, although I do know that the ocean is one and that the Baltic is also part of the ocean. But but a lot of people still struggle to understand that these more uh, inland inland parts of the ocean, uh, oceans like the Black Sea, the even the Mediterranean and the Bal and the Baltic are part of the ocean, and we are still kind of uh, working working on the on the idea that there is only one ocean. The uh, the EU will the Commission will will publish a very important piece of piece of uh, decisions uh, uh, on the ocean governance. Uh, I suppose it's in the, in the latter half half of June that will will come out. We already have the sustainable blue economy strategy and the Commission has stressed the word sustainable here. And of course, the EU biodiversity strategy and the and the and the oldest of them, the marine strategy framework directive of 2008. And of course, the Council has done its part during our presidency. We did a Council conclusions and 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 then the last Council conclusions on, on ocean has been during the Portuguese presidency and then it was very good and we participated and supported Portugal in 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 and during their presidency in that matter too. And I have not touched a very important part of the uh, protection of, of oceans and seas, which is Helcom and I'll leave that completely to Rüdiger. But uh, that is one of the one of the uh, let me say, uh, most important pillars of protecting the Baltic. 
my work has been more or less coordinating coordinating uh, <clears throat> ocean and, and 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 Baltic Sea policies in the in the Prime Minister's office, and 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 try to implement EU global EU and national policies in a co coherent and integrated way. We first started with a with a strategy for the Baltic Sea area in 2017. Then we we uh, uh, ventured further doing maritime policy guidelines in 2019 and, and under maritime here we do understand also marine policies and, and biodiversity and things like that. And then in uh, March this year we finalized the maritime policy action plan. So so we, are, we have been trying to, to build a coherent uh, network of decisions and a framework uh, guidelines to, to kind of um, to pave the way for more coherent decision making here. OK, can I have the next slide, please? But in the center of everything we have been working on is the protection of oceans and seas. And, and that is kind of the, the ultimate, uh, ultimate goal what we have. The, the fulfillment of the Agenda 2030 and protection of oceans and seas, although we do have all different parts of, of the maritime policy added to the whole uh, picture. The next slide, please. The very foundation of I think of, of our um, our marine policies is data, science and information. And I think that the Vilmo program, which which is the Finnish inventory program for underwater marine diversity, which started in 2004, is one of the very important pieces of our decision making. It started, like I said, 2004, but I think that the ac acceleration started in 2011 when the funding uh, where, where better funding was organized and also an important uh, part of the of the of the process was was the joining of the Orland Islands which as you might well known are an uh, autonomous part of Finland and joined the 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 program it's uh, the information collected by Velmo can be used in, in different types of, 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 uh, of uh, policies, but also actions that consider the marine waters. It, it, it can identify hotspots of diversity, but also sites that should be protected. A recent addition to, to, uh, to, to this are the Helmi Habitats program, which started last year which includes restoration of aquatic and, and, and shore habitats. So we have seen the whole lineup from the global decision making to EU decision making and then national decision making here, what we try to try to do in order to protect, uh, protect uh, the, the uh, marine environment. Can I have the next slide, please? We have already finalized our maritime spatial planning for the for all the uh, co coastal and 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 uh, and uh, <clears throat> and all the waters, and we are at now uh, starting to to uh, do the second round of planning planning uh, to start uh, the the second round of maritime spatial planning. The national implementation of the EU biodiversity strategy is ongoing at the moment. We have uh, finalized the, the most of the EBSA process of the CBD and the ecologically significant, significant marine underwater areas in Finland, the EMAS, and are part of the National Maritime Spatial Plan. We have uh, this year we have uh, updated our program of measures of Finland's marine strategy. 2022-27, which is a key part of 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 the uh, the action, and then we have just finalized 
uh, our uh, national action program for the UN Ocean Decade. And that will be published on the World Ocean Day, June the 8th in the uh, Finnish National Museum here in Helsinki. And uh, I, I used to, I, I chair the, the uh, National Committee and, and I think that was uh, one, one of the highlights of, of my career to, to understand how important marine research is for, uh, for, uh, for, for everything. I think uh, data, uh, science, but also uh, ocean literacy are one of the those key uh, words at the moment in order to 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 produce a better environment for 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 Finland's waters, but but also everywhere. We concentrated on the on the on the Baltic, of course, but we did not forget uh, the world's oceans in that uh, national action plan and. And given given enough, uh, adequate funding, we will also try to do our 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 part in in saving the world's oceans. That was the end. Okay, I will thank yes. you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to give my presentation. And if my colleagues from the from the environment minister would like to add something to it, uh, I'd be happy with that. And uh, and and I thank uh, thank the opportunity once again. Thank you, Mr. Strempel. Uh, we will wait for the solving of the technical problems. And I now give the floor to Professor Anna Kulasu of the University of Azores, who will deliver a presentation on deep sea ecosystem from the Mid-Atlantic Range, the, their importance and conservation. Mr. Uh, Professor Kulasu, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and my presentation. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about one of my favorite themes, which is the deep sea. And the deep sea, it's very, very important, but it's a stranger to most of the people. And why? Because the deep sea is out of our sight. If you look to this scheme, the deep sea, it's everything that it's below this line of 200 meters. So it means that it's all the sea floor and all this volume. And if we think that 70% of our planet, it's water, 90% of that water is deep sea. And the deep sea plays a very, very important role in regulating the Earth's climate because it absorbs almost 95% of the excess of heat and more or less 25% of the excess of carbon dioxide. However, I show you this carton from the New Yorker where you can see the ladies stating that I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. But I hope that after this presentation, you start understanding a little bit more of the deep sea and how important they are, and you start caring. When we look to the bottom of the ocean, it's like a landscape full of plains, valleys, mountains, and at the sea floor, you have sea mounts, you have trenches, you have abyssal plains, insular slope, oceanic ridges, hydrothermal vents. And all of that environment hosts a large, one of the largest biodiversity of the world. You can see all the organisms that are in the water column, but also all the organisms that are at the seafloor, and they are very, very important. And why? Because they have a lot of ecosystem services that are essential to our planet. Actually, they are a kind of life support of our planet. They are very important on the nutrient cycle. They are creating habitat for several organisms. They have a huge amount of biodiversity. They are very uh, uh, important. They have an important role in the water circulation and exchange. So they give us material like the fish, the oil, gas, and energy, and minerals, and new chemical products and compounds. They have regulating services. They help our planet to function. 
They are very important on the climate regulation, on the waste absorption, detoxification, carbon sequestration, and biological regulation. And also they provide us cultural services. Productivity. So the metabolism of these organisms, it's very slow. And they tend to grow really, really slowly, to mature very late, and to live very, very long. We can see here, if you compare the men with a black coral, similar to this one that you have here, it has almost 1,000 years, you can see that this coral grows at 0.05 millimeters per year compared to the men. Also, a deep sea fish like this orange roughy that you can see here, it grows at 7.6 centimeters per year and has their first kids. It reproduces the first time with 30 years old. If you compare with the sardine, you can see that they have a very high longevity, a slow growth, and a late reproduction. So they are considered vulnerable. Let's go to the Azores, to our seafloor. We can see that we have a very different habitats, like the cold water gardens and reefs, sponge aggregations, hydrothermal vents, abyssal plants, but also all of these charismatic fauna that we can see at the surface, like the turtles, the devil rays, the blue sharks, we're starting to see that they are coming to the deep sea and they stay there for several hours. You can see here, this was tagged with a satellite marker and you can see that they do dives and stay there for a long time. And we think that they are profiting from the deep sea in terms of energy and to cool down and to take parasites. Also, we have been mapping all the deep sea in the Azores, and we have been understanding what's living there. And this helped to uh, uh, understand and the biodiversity and the functioning of these areas. Also, with this knowledge of the species, we have this experimental hub to do experiments on uh, research on climate change and other deep sea impacts when we can maintain the organisms and try to understand how will they cope with the increased uh, uh, temperature, with the acidification and with other hydrothermal with other um, uh, anthropogenic impact. You can see here hydrothermal vent muscles and here some corals and gorgonies. And with all this knowledge, the Azores was pioneering in developing a network of marine protected areas based on pure science. You can see here the Condor Seamount. It was protected based on science. All the deep sea hydrothermal vents were protected based on science. And also this uh, saddle seamount was also based on science. So this was really important. And for you to, sh to understand why I am so enthusiastic with this um, environment, I'm going to show you here what we have in our water column. These were made by um, a dive uh, on a submersible lula. And you can see here a lot of crustaceans and other fishes that are around 400 meters. And you can see here that the fishes are eating on these uh, krill and crustaceans. Also, in this environment, we can see this jelly organism. This is a parasome that all of these tentacles, they are uh, uh, hunting these prey. And this is a colonial uh, organism. When it dies, it settles on the seafloor and it's food for other organisms. Here we can see lantern fishes. All of these lights, it's because they have uh, on their um, on their body, they are creating bioluminescence. And this will make them have shapes and uh, to communicate and to avoid production. You can see here this line, it's where they have the photophores, which are the organs that produce light. Also, they have these strange mouses that they open very wide to capture prey. Here we have a ctenophore. Also, it has bioluminescence and it looks very fragile, but these uh, uh, tentacles, they when they pass through a swarm of crustaceans, they are very large hunters. 
And here we see a squid. It's a red squid. Actually, the red, it it's not. It's a, a color that it's not being observed on the deep sea. So it means that when they are red, it's like they were invisible to the others, like if they have a mantle of invisibility. And here we are arriving to the bottom of the ocean where some of these animals got trapped during the, because of the currents. And when we are at the bottom of the ocean, we can see lots of corals that have different colors. This is a black coral with 1,000 years, and it's creating habitat. That was thick of several organisms. This is a that looks like carnivore plant. Roses, they have like a spotter lobster. And here the power song that is on the water column, it died and came to the sea floor and became the food of Here we see a sponge that they are actually you can see that the deep also it's a nursery a restaurant. So they are creating habitat. Here again you see they are smaller, but they are creating habitat. And again, here we see the seabird's nest sponge. But also from huge aggregates. And again, there are restaurants, nurseries. Here we are very area. The organic material that fell on the floor. And if we arrive to that deep side of the they exist on this food. Here we have a portion of the plant stem. Here the chemical energy. This fruit here is the sweet and And you can see here shrimp and other organisms around. And here you can see some parts of a very recent from geological that also has. And I hope that this show you that the deep sea, it's not a desert. It's really beautiful. It has a lot of diversity and it has very important functions that we need to protect, to preserve and to maintain. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Colasso. And now I give the floor to Mr. Rudiger Strempel from Helcom. Uh, I hope that now we can present your presentation. Yes, I still have a problem which I cannot explain. However, um, I will try once again and hope you can now see it. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. And it's okay. looking good on the broadcast as well. Thank you very much. So um, thanks once again. And I'm afraid my presentation will not be able to rival the fascination of the previous one. There is just no competing with bioluminescence or mantles of invisibility, and I won't even try. 
but given the bad start I got off to, I suspect you may be happy just to see anything at all. And so um, thank you once again for your indulgence. And I will now try and explain to you what Helcom is doing with regard to implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, we all know that regional action is essential in achieving global aims. And uh, this means also that the role of the regional seas conventions is essential in achieving SDG 14 and indeed, as I will point out, other sustainable development goals as well. So regional seas convention is the operative word here because that is what HELCOM is. Well, if we have a regional seas convention and the title of, of our convention, the name is actually Baltic Marine Environment Protection Commission. This, of course, raises the question as to why the Baltic Sea needs to be protected. And to explain that, um, I put on this slide because um, you should be aware um, that the Baltic Sea is a unique but also very fragile ecosystem. And if you look on the right side of the slide, you see this map and you will see that the Baltic Sea is a semi-enclosed sea. It's almost a lake with a, a very, very tenuous or a very thin connection to the neighboring North Sea, which of course has a number of effects. Um, so we know that water exchange takes a very, very long time, roughly 30 years, meaning in other words that anything that enters the Baltic Sea today, theoretically at least, will still be there in the year 2052. So ponder that, 30 years is a long time. And we have a lot of things entering the Baltic Sea actually because um, there are seven major rivers, and here I'm stressing the word major, which flow into the Baltic Sea and countless smaller ones. Um, and of course, they bring with them not only water, but also a number of things that we'd prefer not to have in the Baltic Sea or in the rivers indeed. So um, this is uh, another element which makes uh, this ecosystem sensitive and, and um, rather delicate and fragile. In addition, the Baltic Sea is also a brackish sea, which means that it has a low salinity and the salinity declines from west to east. And in the northeastern reaches of the Baltic Sea, the salinity is extremely low. It's almost fresh water, which in turn also means that we have a number of species which are specifically adapted to this ecosystem. And of course, they are also very sensitive. So this means that the Baltic Sea in itself is specific and fragile. But to add to our woes, if you now look at the catchment area of the sea, which is um, the hatched area around the sea, you will see that it's uh, roughly four times as big as the sea itself. And it is home to a population of approximately 85 million people. It's an economically very vibrant area with a high degree of economic activity of various kinds from agriculture to industry and anything in between. There's a lot of tourism, of course, as well. And the sea itself is a busy, very busy waterway. In normal times during Corona period, the Corona period, this might not have been the case or will not have been the case, but in normal times, there are up to 2,000 larger vessels sailing the Baltic Sea at any given time. And this is, again, larger vessels. So this does not count for many smaller vessels and leisure craft that are also out there. So you can, and of course, there are also other maritime activities um, taking place on the Baltic Sea. Um, so you can see that the Baltic Sea is subjected to a, a multitude of pressures and unfortunately is woefully poorly equipped to deal with those. And this is what prompted the then seven countries around the Baltic Sea in 1974 to take action. Because while the uh, ecological status of the Baltic Sea was quite good towards the end of the 19th century, it declined massively and rapidly in the 20th century. And uh, the peak pollution period, the, the period when the, uh, the status was worst was uh, in the 1970s and 80s, as you can see in this graphic on the right here, which refers to phosphorus, but you could find similar graphics um, for other um, elements of uh, the um, Baltic marine environment. And this is what incited the countries then to sign the Helsinki Convention. The seven countries at the time, of course, uh, there have been major geopolitical shifts uh, since then, and these geopolitical shifts have been reflected because in 1992, the convention was updated, if you like, to reflect both those geopolitical shifts and, of course, also developments in international environmental and marine law and science. And so today we have a convention which dates back to 1992 and entered into force in the year 2000 and which is what actually governs our work on a day to day basis. As you can see in these various spheres, then um, we have 10 contracting parties at the moment, which means all Baltic Sea countries, including Russia and the European Commission. Now, of course, a convention is a piece of paper. You need to bring it to life. 
to do that, you need convention bodies and you need a decision making body. The supreme decision making body of the uh, Helsinki Convention is the Helsinki Commission and hence Helcom. And this commission exists in three guises, if you like. The, the supreme um, variant of that is the ministerial meeting, which however takes place only every three years, most recently in the fall of last year, in October 2021 in Lübeck, Germany. Well, if we have a meeting every three years, you can imagine that that is certainly not enough, especially in, in a fast changing political environment and ecological environment also um, to, to move things forward sufficiently quickly and with enough impetus. So we have, in addition to the ministerial meeting, the Helsinki Commission itself, which meets once a year, normally in March. And because once a year still is perhaps not quite sufficient, we also have the heads of delegations, uh, which meet twice a year in summer and in winter, usually in June and in December. At the moment, as you can imagine, some of these processes are not working quite um, as usual, but nonetheless, Helcom is still operational. We're still working. One thing we're proud of actually is that we're a science-based organization, so we don't take random decisions in fact, but we try to take decisions based on the most recent and most relevant science to feed this science into the work of Helcom, because of course the Helsinki Commission itself, these are decision makers, um, these are people from the ministries representing each contracting party. We have Helcom working groups and expert groups. Um, here it still says and networks, it will soon only be expert groups. Um, and the expert groups provide the scientific input that we need. And the Helcom working groups pre uh, present, if you like, an interface between these expert groups and the commission itself um, to then enable them to um, take into account this scientific information. And then we have, of course, the Helcom Secretariat, which is the organization that I represent and which basically um, conducts all the regular business that any convention secretariat, um, such as those in the UN system as well, would conduct. So how do we get things done? Well, so we have the Helsinki Convention as the basis of our work. Then the contracting parties take recommendations uh, or issue recommendations and adopt recommendations. And these are quite aptly called recommendations and very honestly called recommendations because while the Helsinki Convention as such is an instrument of international law and is legally binding, the decisions taken within the framework of the Helsinki Convention are only soft law. So they are recommendations, which is not to say, however, that they're being ignored because by and large, they are in fact being implemented to a considerable extent and some 260 recommendations have been adopted in the course of the existence of Helcom since 1974. And then we have something, so we also conduct monitoring and assessment, uh, which you see um, in the uh, second column from the right here. And in the center, at the center of this page, you see action plans and projects. And these contain specific actions. So it's not just talk, it's not just rhetoric here. We're really talking about specific actions and we have very, um, sectorial and theme specific action plans, such as, for instance, our regional action plan on marine litter. And then we have the Baltic Sea action plan, which is uh, what I'm um, planning to talk to you about here today. So the first Baltic Sea action plan was adopted in the year 2007 with a view to achieving good environmental status for the Baltic Sea in 2021. We're now in 2022, and unfortunately, I have to confess we're nowhere close to good environmental status. So um, have we failed? No, we haven't. What we can say is um, that, uh, as you can see on the slide, 71% of joint actions, actions which are to be carried out um, through HELCOM and its working groups have been implemented and roughly one third of the national actions to be carried out at the national level have also been implemented. So obviously things have been done and there has been a measurable impact on the Baltic Sea. So nonetheless, we have not achieved our aims, similarly to the, the European Union, which of course has not achieved the aims of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And this is cold comfort, of course, but maybe it makes us feel a bit less lonely in our insufficiency. Having said that, and having noted that obviously the Baltic Sea Action Plan did have an effect, the contracting parties decided at their ministerial meeting in 2018 in Brussels, that this Baltic Sea Action Plan should be updated. So we did not talk about scrapping the old action plan. Instead, we said, let's build on what we have. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's build on what we have. And the uh, phrase at the time was, it's going to be an evolution 
and not a revolution. And so we embarked on a process based on a strong political mandate by the ministerial meeting in 2018 to update the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And we see here some key words in, in relation to that. Um, so it's going to be an evolution, not a revolution. We base this very strongly on the ecosystem approach. We conducted something which I think is rather unique worldwide still for the time being, and that was a, an analysis of, of the sufficiency of measures that were taken um, within the framework of the first Baltic Sea Action Plan. And we also aligned this very closely with global targets and commitments. And um, then we updated the Baltic Sea Action Plan with the intention of having all actions in this Baltic Sea Action Plan implemented by 2030. And this date, of course, is no coincidence because it then aligns us also with the um, um, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So the Baltic Sea Action Plan is our central tool for achieving the HELCOM vision. It's not the only one, but it's our central tool. And that HELCOM vision is a healthy Baltic Sea environment with diverse biological components functioning in balance, resulting in a good ecological status and supporting a wide range of sustainable and, and um, economic and social activities. How do we do that? Well, you can you can see this graphic here. So we have the overall vision. And then we have segments in this, um, this Baltic Sea Action Plan uh, dedicated to different areas or different, if you like, sectors of the environment. So we have the ecosystem, the biodiversity aspect, the ecosystem needs to be healthy and resilient. And that's, as you see, this part here with the duck and the fish in it. And underneath you see these two triang three triangles um, and they reflect um, three other segments, namely a segment on hazardous substances and litter and one on environmentally sustainable sea-based activities and a Baltic Sea unaffected by eutrophication because eutrophication, in fact, remains the single most important and the single most pressing um, uh, problem that we are faced with in the Baltic Sea despite decades of cooperation. And then we have horizontal topics, um, which include topics such as climate change, um, economic and social analysis and uh, other issues which were not or perhaps not yet sufficiently addressed in the previous Baltic Sea Action Plan. So why is this graphic structured as it is? Well, because we realize that the achievement of these triangular goals down here feed into the goal of a Baltic ecosystem that is healthy and resilient. And that, of course, then basically means if we can achieve that, we have achieved the vision which we have at the top in this green sphere. How do we do this? Well, all 199 Baltic Sea Action Plan actions, because that's what it is, 199 actions have individual target years for their implementation. And the last actions need to be implemented again by 2030 at the latest. They have been assigned so they don't just hang in midair and nobody feels responsible or takes ownership to one or several HELCOM bodies for monitoring, guidance and contributing to their implementation. And they also have specific criteria by which their achievement will be measured. And if you want to follow up on how they are being measured and, and how this is being implemented, you can find the Helcom Explorer, which is a tool on our website, which um, will give you information on that. So, yes, we have um, these four segments, uh, sorry, these five segments, um, the sectorial segments, and then, of course, um, the horizontal action segment. and you will see that each of these segments contains ecological objectives, which reflect the desired state of the environment and management objectives, which describe the desired change in pressure or in the conservation status. So you can see that this is actually quite a practical approach that we're taking. And you can see um, that um, there are in some cases quite a few management objectives to reach these ecological objectives, as you see here for the biodiversity segment. So the biodiversity segment contains 34 actions under four different themes, which I'm not going to go into now because it would take too long. And it addresses several SDG targets. And this is something that you will find across this Baltic Sea Action Plan because it addresses more than one target. Here we have 14.2 um, and 14.5, which are of course um, biodiversity related. When we move on to um, other um, segments, you will see that actually the Baltic Sea Action Plan addresses more than just SDG 14. So we move on to eutrophication. We have the goal, which is the Baltic Sea unaffected by eutrophication. And then again, we have ecological objectives and management objectives. 
Here under this segment, we have 36 actions under five different themes. And here now you can actually see that it addresses quite a few and rather diverse SDGs. So we have SDG 2.4, which is sustainable food production, not something you would necessarily immediately associate with our work, or 6.3, which re um, refers to improving water quality, as indeed does 6.5. And then, of course, again, also um, SDG 14, in this case, 14.1, which um, uh, is related to preventing marine pollution. The next segment refers to hazardous substances and litter and is very, very relevant, of course, because marine litter is an increasingly um, uh, a prominent issue. And um, the ambassador referred to this actually earlier today um, in his presentation um, or at his opening words. Um, and so we have a segment which is specifically related to this area. And it is then split up. As you can see, the ecological objectives are split up into hazardous substances and marine litter and the management objectives likewise and marine litter. So the ecological objective is to have no harm to marine life for marine litter. And again, now if you look at the 32 actions, which are grouped under these two themes, it addresses various SDGs. In this case, 12.2, 12.5, 12.4, and then again, 14.1. Then we have the um, sea-based activities segment, and this is by far the largest one, actually. Um, and this one uh, aims for Baltic Sea unaffected by hazardous substances and litter. And it contains 67 action, uh, actions under four themes. And not surprisingly, therefore, it then also, again, covers a fair range of different uh, SDG targets, ranging from 2.4 all the way to 14.4 with uh, 12 in between 13 um, as well. And this is, of course, um, very relevant to us. And if you look at 14.1, again, we have by 2025, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, including marine debris and nutrient pollution. So once again, we come back also to marine litter. Um, and in that regard, I'd like to also refer to our Regional Marine uh, Litter Action Plan, which was updated and adopted along with the Baltic Sea Action Plan in the fall of last year at the ministerial meeting in Lübeck, Germany. And then we come to the horizontal topics segment, and this is something we didn't have before, and this encompasses climate change, the issues of monitoring, maritime spatial planning, in, in which actually the Baltic Sea, as you may know, is a front runner, then also uh, an area which is relevant but still under development, if you like, which is economic and social analysis of environmental impacts, um, and then we're also talking about hotspots, about knowledge exchange and awareness raising. We heard earlier today also the word ocean literacy. Of course, this is something that is highly relevant to all of us, and that is something we're also addressing. And then, not to be um, underestimated, of course, the issue of financing. And I would like to leave it at that. Um, and um, since um, we heard earlier today about the SDG 14 conference and about the issue of side events, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that Helcom is in fact hosting or the, the Helcom parties um, due to the current political situation, we had to somewhat realign that, are hosting a side event on marine protected areas and OECMs at the Lisbon conference, um, which will take place on the 30th of June from 11.30 to 12.45. And I would, of course, be delighted if I could see some of you there. And in any case, I'm very much looking forward to going to Lisbon. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Strumpel. And we are very happy to know that the Alcom contracting parties are hosting a side event uh, in Lisbon. Uh, we now proceed to the questions and answers. And there is one question I would like to ask to the three of you. From your point of view, what would be the most desirable or the outcome or outcomes from the UN Ocean Conference? Perhaps you, Mr. Schrampel, would like to be the first to answer? Well, we need a very strong message because, um, as we heard earlier, the, the deep sea, and this is not just something um, that refers to the deep sea, but it, it still amazingly um, refers to the oceans and, and the world seas as a whole. We need a strong message that we need to protect our oceans and seas 
and that we have no time to lose in doing so because indeed they are life support systems. So if we can get this message and if we can get um, uh, ownership on this message and we can get and enlist the support of all participants, um, and that of course includes not only countries, but also the scientific sector, which is so crucially important, and also other stakeholders to enlist and to basically rally behind this flag of protecting our oceans because they are in many ways our future. I think that is a major outcome that we can achieve and that we can um, hope to achieve and, and um, need to achieve if this conf uh, conference is um, to be successful. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stample. Uh, Mr. Saramaki? <clears throat> thank you. I think that the subject raised by the ambassador should be uh, should be one of the one of the important goals here. I mean, uh, I've been um, to quite a few of the of the UNFCC climate conferences, and 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 there the the ocean struggle sometimes to to to, to for they they are they are more important goals in those meetings to be reached. Than to talk about the oceans. Well, I don't think so, but but that is that is the feeling I get. And there are lots of processes, private and public processes, that that uh, try to 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 protect the oceans. And maybe we need need a treaty. I don't know. We need a process that combines everything that is going on on the on the ocean front, kind of a framework. And, and that is something that, that I would like to see in the Lisbon uh, UN Ocean Conference that to be to be started there as an idea how, how we unite the forces because in my presentation and you know quite well that there are many different processes that concern the oceans and, and, and how to put everything together. That is the big question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soramaki. Professor Anna Kulasu. Thank you. Well, I agree with 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 um, with all the, the the other speakers, and I really think that we need to move forward to an effective protection of the oceans. Um, this planet, it's basically oceans, and they regulate the climate, among other services that they provide. So uh, I think that we need an effective protection. And there are other, uh, like CBD, it's aiming for 30% of protection. And we know by many scientific colleagues that 30% is at least. So if we could have a statement that at least 30% of our oceans will be protected, and the ones that are not being protected and are damaged, they are uh, uh, kept for recovery and restoration, this would be already something, a very strong message to to the, the to our world and to the uh, uh, generations that are coming, knowing that we are not just going to preserve, but also going to restore what we have damaged. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Soramaki, uh, I've been reading Finland's maritime policy guidelines and also the press release on the action plan for maritime policy. And there you mentioned that Finland has several competencies and skills that could share with other countries. Finland has also adopted an Africa strategy last year. Uh, do you have plans to cooperate with African countries in the area of protecting the marine ecosystems. You are muted. Okay. I, I do. I do apologize for not not tapping on my mic. No uh, problem. I have to be very diplomatic on this subject. We have had a lot of discussions with our with our uh, with my colleagues in the in the foreign ministry, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and uh, until now we have not yet re uh, reached a solution how to proceed. With the African countries, we have had projects before, uh, especially on the scientific side. How to how to how to um, let me say um, how to map uh, or, or kind of a, do the so-called so-called Belmore pre approach in African countries, and we would like to like to continue with that, but but that is a political decision which has not yet been made. Of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Soramaki. 
There is another question that I would like to ask to Mr. Strempel. Uh, Portugal is a state party to the Convention for the Protection of Marine Environment in the Northeast Atlantic, the OSPAR Convention. Is there any cooperation between HALCOM and OSPAR in this area of managing, protecting and restoring marine ecosystems? Thank you for that question. And uh, yes, indeed, there is. So, of course, we, we have a joint indicators group and we cooperate at the working group level in various ways. We also have mutual representation between the two um, conventions. Um, so there is a an ongoing thread of conversation. Um, and in fact, um, the side event that we're staging um, at the Lisbon conference now in June will be staged also in cooperation with OSPAR. Uh, as well as uh, WCPA um, and uh, the um, uh, Coalition Clean Baltic, which is actually um, an umbrella organization of Baltic Sea um, NGOs um, and IASS. So this is a cooperative effort and um, OSPAR will actually be involved in this as well. So there are various strands of cooperation between Helcom and OSPAR because, of course, Generally, we aim to cooperate um, with other regional seas. We've also been exhorted by our contracting parties repeatedly to do so. Um, and then, of course, we focus not only, but also to a very large extent on the neighboring seas, on the other European um, regional seas. That also includes the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And, of course, OSPAR and the North Sea, which is the sea which is directly connected to the Baltic Sea. Of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Strampel. Uh, and then I would like to ask a question to Professor Anna Kulasu. Uh, we've seen through your presentation that you are very enthusiastic about these deep sea ecosystems and Portugal and the autonomous region of the Azores have played uh, an important part in establishing marine protected areas to protect these ecosystems. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think we could share with other countries as best practices to achieve the goals of protecting the this kind of vulnerable ecosystems? Thank you. Well, it, this was based on science, so it was the use of the uh, it was the use of the best scientific available knowledge and a very strong dialogue between the scientists and um, the government and the stakeholders. And I think this is the key. It's the dialogue, because it's if it's just a, a, a preservation in the paper and the stakeholders are not involved, or if the government does not understand why this should be protected by the part of the scientists, things are not working. So it's this strong dialogue between government, scientists and stakeholders that made us able to create these these areas and the, and it's not just because the areas are created that the dialogue stops this is everything can be uh, changed everything is adaptable even the perception of the different stakeholders so the dialogue needs to be maintained even when the things are already on paper or on law so th i think this is the my feeling of the good uh, uh, results that we have here is a strong and very close dialogue that is always uh, um, it keeps going on. Thank you very much, Professor Anna Kulasu. And uh, are there any other questions? Yes, Ambassador, the floor is maybe, yours. Maybe I have. Uh not not a question but maybe some 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 remarks that uh, finally i have a camera and i can you can see me and i can see you perfectly this uh, this webinar had, had some technical problems but i think it was really really interesting and one of the one of the things that we reached an agreement and it is good to hear you saying something similar to what the secretary general of the united nations said when it when he, he started to prepare this conference that uh, uh, we all should bring plans not only speeches and that's something that this conference needs to achieve it's, it's some plans to 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 help 
the oceans uh, and the seas too, of course. But basically the ocean, that is what is uh, we are here protecting. Uh, but having all that in mind, I, I have one of the areas that we are trying also to uh, highlight here is the the and there's a, a a side event that is organized not in Lisbon but in the north of Portugal regarding local and regional governments uh, participation in in this conference and in the protection of the and the achieving of of the SDG of this SDG. So uh, I would like to ask you all. Um, how do you think and uh, that local uh, governments can participate uh, more and be more involved? In in case of uh, Mr. Soromaki, I could even ask you because if if you have any plans to send someone from your regional areas, like from the Holland Islands and from the cities, the coastal cities and coastal regions, to this side event uh, representing also uh, regions from Finland. But uh, my my my. Uh, general question was that what uh, is really the the role you see for local and, and regional areas uh, to play in the protection of the ocean. Thank you very much and thank you very much for your participation. I think it was very useful and very interesting. And amazing uh, pictures of the deep sea. Uh, I, I Now I'm very, very, very interested in go and try to visit myself. I, I visit uh, Azores, but only uh, on the ground, never in the deep sea. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know who wants to start, but maybe uh, Mr. Soromaki and then uh, around. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, I think <clears throat> For example, uh, the uh, the maritime spatial planning in our country was led by the regions, so so it was a pro uh, a process not uh, directed from 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 the government or from the ministries, but but led by the regions. And I think we always uh, we are not astonished, but we are very happy when regions, cities and municipalities take the lead. And I think that is a very important thing because in, in many ways, uh, uh, all the, 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 uh, the uh, areas can be more straightforward, for example, in protecting uh, the coastal waters, protecting uh, marine biodiversity, than the government that has to take all aspects into account. And I think that is that is something that that we should think. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I will be checking if if any of our regions uh, are are participating in the event, and I'll spread the word that that the participants should 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 be there. And I have been whale watching in the Azores, so I'm I'm quite happy happy to 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 be recall calling those memories a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Strampel? Yes, thank you very much. Well, I think uh, bringing communities and the local players on board is actually essential to, to achieving um, our aims because, as I said earlier, we need the ownership and the engagement of all those concerned. And of course, coastal communities are immediately concerned by everything that relates uh, to the oceans and the seas. And therefore, we need their support um, and we need to support them as well in, in some of their endeavors. Uh, and this is something that I think is is, is equally true for uh, for global oceans and seas all around the world, not just for the Baltic Sea. So I think it is extremely imp important and essential to achieve this. And it is also something that um, we at Helcom take quite seriously. And just um, as one example, I can also tell you, for instance, that among the many observers that Balt that that Helcom has, we also have the Union of the Baltic Cities because we need the cities, we need the communities on board, we need ownership from every possible level, um, and then engagement and activity from every possible level if we wish to achieve this, because as you could also see when, when I mentioned uh, the various SDGs that the work of Helcom relates to, of course it relates to areas which are of immediate concern to the communities and uh, to the municipalities around the Baltic Sea. If you consider, for instance, the issue of runoff um, into the sea, this is of course something and of, of um, um, sewage treatment facilities. These are all areas in which, of course, we need the support and the cooperation of, of the communes and of the, the, the uh, municipalities and cities around the Baltic Sea. So I think it's essential. We cannot 
go it alone. Um, if we just have the countries and even if we just have the regions cooperating, that will not suffice. We do need that level on board, most definitely. Thank you, Mr. Strempel. Uh, Professor Anna Kulasu. Thank you. Well, I, I always say uh, think globally, locally, and I think this is really the key because for so even small things like ocean literacy, actions with schools that depends, it's really local, depends on municipalities and even uh, um, lower um lower uh, uh, um oh I, I don't remember the name L lower local uh, um areas and uh, i think that in what regards uh, ocean literacy um uh, capacitation of the local power in what regards um the ocean uh, subjects this is really really important because that way they can be active players when they are uh, having public discussions uh, or uh, discussing projects, etc. So for me, this is the key. It's ocean literacy, capacitation of the public, of the local administration, because that way they will can be active players. And the only way it's going all together, because if just coming from the top, it's not enough. It needs to be a bottom up process in what regards the preservation of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kulasu, and thank you all very much for your interesting and thorough presentations. I think it is safe to conclude that a lot has already been done to protect vulnerable mar marine and coastal ecosystems, but a lot still needs to be done. We are looking forward to a high level present from your side at the UN Ocean Conference and its side events. And we are very happy to know that Halcom and OSPAR will, will be co-hosting a side event. Before we close this webinar, I invite you all to watch another video about the UN Ocean Conference. And I hope this time we have better luck with the technical issues. I wish you all a very nice afternoon for those of you in Portugal and evening for those of you who are watching us in the Baltic region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Tiago, the floor is yours to present the video. Thank you. Very if much. not, my colleague will edit the webinar and include <laughs> the videos. <laughs> bye, everybody. Bye. Lisboa recebe o um encontro decisivo para salvar o oceano, proteger o futuro. A Conferência dos Oceanos das Nações Unidas, organizada por Portugal e Quénia, decorre de 27 de junho a 1 de junho. Governantes e parceiros sociais debatem ações para implementar o Objetivo de Desenvolvimento Sustentável 14, que visa proteger a vida marinha. Em 2022, o futuro do oceano decide-se em Lisboa.